Um, so we're very excited to have with us today Dr. Edna Nachshon, who is a professor at uh, the Jewish Theological Seminary, has published many books. Most recently, we had her here talking about her um, book on Jewish responses to Shylock, um, the merchant, wrestling with Shylock, Jewish responses to the Merchant of Venice, which was published at Cambridge University Press, uh, April 2016. And um, very notably, she also was a curator of From Bowery to Broadway, the Museum of the City of New York's exhibition on the Yiddish Theater here in New York, um, which was an incredible exhibition a few years ago, uh, part, in partnership with YIVO and using tons of YIVO materials. So we're really proud um, and excited to have Edna here to talk about the Yiddish Theater today. Welcome, Edna. Thank you. And I love to always. <laughs> First of all, welcome. I'm awed that you came because in this horrible weather, after a scorching weekend, and with raining, with, with rain just, just looming out there, I'm not sure I would go to my own talk. So, <laughs> chapeau. Uh, I wanted to just get a sense of you. First of all, would some people come down here? We're subscribed like, like Jews in the diaspora. Why don't you come, clo come closer? We'll be a community. If you want to leave early, you can. I'm not going to hold you back. Those who sit, I know the trick. You sit at the end, right near the <laughs> let's, let's Let's be together here. How many people here are with the Zoomer program, with the summer program? Wow, that's great. That's wonderful. I hope you're enjoying it and learning a lot. That's nice. And how many are not with the summer program? Wow, that's formidable. Okay. So, how many of you are interested in theater? Of course. Uh, who has been to a Yiddish show other than, you know what? Good, that's not messed up, okay. So, when, when Yiddish theater is mentioned, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? One word, one adjective. The book, okay, what else? Shunt, okay. I'm sorry? Mikhoyev, okay. Tomaszewski, okay. What about an adjective? Don't throw this name at me. Overacting, okay. You know, my avant garde, okay. Anything else? All right, I didn't hear the one word that used to come to my mind when I was little because I grew up with, with uh, I was familiar with Yiddish theater. My stepfather was a Yiddish journalist in Israel, so it was not a world that was alien to me. And the first thing that would come to my mind would be old. To me, Yiddish theater was old. Old people, old actors, Old. Well, I'd like to introduce you today to a time when Yiddish theater evoked words like young, exciting, beautiful, sexy, edgy, scandalous, artsy, and yes, also avant garde. And that was, of course, a very different time, many years ago. And instead of starting with a dry history, I thought we'd do something else. Uh, we'll get to it, but I'd like to invite you to come along and attend with me a Yiddish performance that really took place, that actually took place, it's documented, more than 100 years ago. The year is 1901, so get yourself in the mood. Imagine yourself dressed accordingly, and it's a cold February night. We can actually go to one of the three theaters in New York. 
the Talia, the Windsor, and the People's Theater. This theater provides the chief amusement of the Yiddish immigrant community in New York, which at this point numbers about half a million people. There'll be more coming in later years. In fact, last year, that is to say, the year 1900, the three theaters presented 1,100 shows during the year and sold about 2 million tickets. That's not me saying it, that's historian Moses Rishon. So why, why was the theater so popular? And it was. Well, the uptown Jewish um, English language newspaper, the Jewish Standard, not the Jewish Standard, I'm sorry, the Jewish Messenger, my mistake, explained to it perplexed readers this curious phenomenon. And I need someone to read. Somebody with good eyes. Go ahead. That's written in 1901. Now, when we're talking about these three theaters, and there would be more to come later on, these theaters, all located in the Bowery area, were not, were not small little places. They're not hole-in-the-wall venues. The Windsor could accommodate 2,000 people, the Talia 1,600, and the People's Theater, which is where we're going tonight, um, sat around 14 to 1,500 people. Now, do you know the size of a Broadway house, just to compare? Because these are numbers. It doesn't really mean all that much. I have no idea how many people can sit in this auditorium. Alex, maybe you know. OK. So think of a theater with 2,000 seats. That's quite impressive. So. Uh, let's see, uh, Richard Rogers Theater, where Hamilton is playing, how many seats? 1319. The Ambassador, where Chicago is playing, I'm deliberately mentioning hits, big theaters, 1140. Uh, the Majestic, where Phantom is playing, 1645. So this gives you a sense how large those theaters were. 2,000 people, 1,500 people, and they were full. So I decided to take you to the People's Theater. And why? Because right now, remember, it's February 1901. It's presenting The Jewish King Lear by playwright Jacob Gordon. It's not a new play. It opened in almost 10 years ago in 1892. Oh, this is just to show you how excited the gallery used to be. Uh, again, the, the drawing was in fact made in 1901 came out in a wonderful book that everyone should read, The Spirit of the Ghetto. I hope uh, you familiarize yourself with it. It's available online. It's wonderful. It really gives you the taste of the, the, the time of Jewish life back then in real time, not as an afterthought. But let's go back to the Jewish King Lear. Koenig Lear, Jacob Adler. It opened, as I said, nine years ago. In 1901. But what a sensational revelation it was. It certainly kicked off Gordon's career as our greatest dramatist, our Jewish Ibsen. Some say even he's our Jewish Shakespeare. Who knows? He's written many plays over the last nine years. Among them,
the eternal Mirla Ephraim, which opened, this is Jacob Gordon, also drawn by uh, Jacob Epstein, also around 1901. So he wrote Mirla Ephraim, which opened three years ago with Madame Kenny Lipton. She originated the role. In fact, she commissioned the play. And the one of a kind man, God, and devil that premiered last year starring the great David Kessler, who played a pious man who sells his soul to the devil. You may ask, why should we go to an older play rather than see something new? Perhaps one of the other theaters, perhaps at one of the other theaters. Well, first, because the Jewish King Lear is starring Jacob P. Adler, the greatest dramatic actor of the Yiddish stage, whom we reverentially call Neshera Godel, the Great Eagle, an honorific reference to his last name. Adler is now 46 years old. He is striking in appearance, tall, majestic, with a sonorous voice. He's a mesmerizing actor. Every glance, <clears throat> every motion comes from his soul. It makes your own soul tremble. <clears throat> I've heard that this year he's also due to play Shylock at the People's Theater in Yiddish. No doubt it will be a very special event, but that's for a separate theater visit. Another, go another reason we're going to the People's Theater is because it's a kind of act of solidarity. We are all working people and support our union. What's the connection? Last year, the actors at the People's Theater went on strike, demanded, demanding an adequate weekly salary rather than what they got under the antiquated system, which left them with very little to live on. All the other theater employees knew they were right and joined the strike, and the actors won. Now we have the one-year-old Hebrew Actors Union. It's the first actors' union in the world. It has preceded by 20 years the formation of actors' equity, and we're pretty proud for serving as a model for them. Even though we go quite often to the theater, I usually prefer to go on the weekend. Well, it's easier. That's also when they show the newest productions. But tonight is a bit special. You see, our union has arranged for tonight's performance, and the truth is we sort of had to buy tickets so the union can make some extra money. You see, they pay about two, three hundred dollars for the show. We pay full price, and all the money in between goes to the union to support the union. They call it a benefit. Okay. Here you see an example of a benefit for the Jewish King Lear. These benefits always take place during the weekdays, and you don't get to see the newest show. But that's OK, because we'll also get to meet a lot of people we know, and that's always nice. Theater is not very far from where we live. It's a nice walk, but it's a bit cold, and we're eager to find our seats and get in. We enter the large hall, find our seats, and make ourselves comfortable. Looking straight ahead to the stage, we notice the beautiful stage curtain. It has a large picture of Moses atop of Mount Sinai, presenting the Ten Commandments to the children of Israel, the multitude stretching into the horizon. No cherubs and naked ladies here, like in the Goetia Theater. This is a Jewish curtain. This is us, we think proudly. We, mere shop workers, 
are in fact the descendants of an old and venerable people of prophets and kings. And it makes you feel good about yourself. In the meantime, the place fills up with young and old, men and women. Thank God the theater does not allow people to bring their children in. Because those children always sit on their parents' lap and they can be quite a nuisance. Still, even without the kids, it's noisy with everyone talking with their friends and constantly moving and changing seats and the and the hair. But finally, the curtain opens and the play begins. On stage, you see the preparation for a festive poor meal at a rich man's home. And you can practically smell the aroma of the beautiful Purim Chala, the silly servant places on the beautiful table. The whole family, nicely dressed, comes in to sit at the table. They're all waiting for Reb Dovidel, the head of the household. That's Jacob Adler. And as soon as he enters, they all rise, and we in the audience clap our hands to let Adler know that we really adore him. As the first act progresses, we see how Reb Dovidel, a generous but dictatorial patriarchal father, decides to divide his fortune among his three daughters. The two oldest ones are married, one to a misnagged, the other one to a chosset. The youngest, Tabele, who still lives at home and is her father's most beloved child. Unlike her sisters, she's single, but thinks of books and learning rather than marriage. And is completely disinterested in the expensive diamond jewelry he heaps on her. I wish she gave it to us, but all right. She's not interested. What can I say? Well, you know how the story goes. Tabula refuses to participate in the sort of game her father imposes on his daughters and would not parrot what he wants to hear. He gets terribly angry and rejects her, leaving her part of the inheritance with his miserly daughters and sanctimonious but crooked son and daughter. In Act Two, you see how poorly Rev Dovidel and his wife are treated by their ungrateful children. The eldest, who is harsh and selfish, treats her mother like a maid and brings her father to a point of physical starvation, giving him no access to food, not even a small piece of bread. When you see Dovidel plead for a slice of bread, you're so moved you're tempted to offer him the sandwich you've brought with you. Things get worse, and when they become unbearable, Dovidel finally leaves the house with his trusted servant. And this really originally very rich man roams the world like a destitute beggar. It, it, it's terrible to watch. But anyway, years pass. Table lays back in town with her husband, a doctor, and an advocate of Ascole. She has graduated, mind you, from medical school against all odds and is now a doctor herself. She and her blind and destitute father reunite. She and her physician husband realize right away that Dreb Dovidel's blindness is caused by cataracts. Surgeries performed on stage and vision, understanding, and love are restored, with the old man seeing the past foolishness and stubborn adherence to old world ideas that he held on to, that opposed science and equal opportunity to women. Very important to Gordon. The play has ended and you're filled with all sorts of emotion. 
The abuse of the old man at his children's hands broke your heart. And his reunion with his beloved daughter made you cry with joy and relief. All kinds of thoughts and feelings run through you. You think of the family you left in the old country and you resolve that tomorrow, before or after work, you'll go to the Jewish bank on the land sea and send the money you saved for that coveted new coat you wanted, you'll send it home. It will go a long way in Russia. Your old booby will be able to have some proper Shabbos meal, and your dad will finally be able to replace his old torn boots. And then you begin to also think of yourself and your, about your own life here, and you know that though it's not really possible for you to be like Tabele and become a doctor, you should really register for that secretarial course at night school so that you too can make something of yourself. And maybe one day, when you're married and have a daughter, she will become a doctor. Perhaps. But this was a very special night. And after this, let's shift to the more formal part. Okay. Let's go to the beginning and move for a short while to Eastern Europe, where the Yiddish theater began. There were various elements that contributed to the creation of a modern Yiddish stage. Purim plays, Muscillic writings, and so forth. But I'd like to draw to your attention to the importance of music and to its, on the formation of the Yiddish stage and I'd like to emphasize that music from day one was in the DNA of the Yiddish theater. Not every theater begins like that. There are theaters that develop out of the spoken word. There are theaters that develop out of religious rites. The Yiddish theater began with a song and with music. Why the importance of music? Because when you come to think of it, in traditional East European Jewish life, who were the professional performers? Cantors, singers, and some instrumentalists. They were the only ones who had a modicum of professional education and training. They were the performers of the community and by the middle of the 19th century, as Eastern Europe Jewish life began to urbanize and become more secular, music proved to be the least objectionable form of performance for traditional Jews because of its non-representational nature and its all-male identity. It was therefore natural that the first modern professional Jewish performers would be itinerant musicians who sang at cafes and other such venues, entertaining their mostly working class audience with songs, some poetry recitation, and short, very short sketches. At times, even introducing a bit of dialogue and using a little bit of makeup and maybe a prop or two to add dramatic flavor to their numbers. They were really the forerunners of the Yiddish theater. So much so that for years, you needed to have a good singing voice in order to make it on the Yiddish stage. In fact, some claim that the great admiration of Jacob P. Adler for Gordon started because Adler did not have such a great voice and so was much more interested in dramatic parts and hence um, commissioned those particular plays. Now the music is interesting because no one of the great actors on the non-Jewish stage was required to have such a good singing voice. Sarah Berger didn't sing, uh, Henry Irving didn't have to sing, but for a Yiddish actor, being able to sing a song and deliver it properly was really important. 
So the Yiddish theater came into being in a local wine garden in Yassi, Romania in 1876. Its so-called father, there's no mother in this case, <laughs> was this gentleman, Avon Goldfaden. Then, you know, you see pictures and all these men are older, but think of it, he was 26 at the time. He came to Yassi to establish a newspaper, but he soon changed the course of his life and certainly that of Jewish culture when upon visiting a popular wine garden, he met and joined forces with two Yiddish singers who appeared to perform at the venue and offered to add to the musical numbers a skimpy storyline that would offer some basic narrative continuity to the performance. And this is how he describes it. We need someone to read. Someone who hasn't read yet. Go ahead. Those are the names of the two singers. This may seem kind of simplistic, but the moment was right, the public was thrilled, and soon the multi-talented Goldfaden was heading his own traveling theater company, for which he functioned as producer, playwright, director, composer, and librettist. His early offerings resembled Commedia dell'arte, with a combination of an uncomplicated fixed scenario with improvised dialogue and stage business but he soon began to write lavish operettas, some of which, like The Witch, here we see a 1925 production, The Tukunilemo, and Shalamis, which has given us the immensely popular lullaby, I think everyone knows it, Roger Kismet Mandlin, All these became beloved classics of the Jewish stage. The tales were simple, adopted from a variety of Jewish and European sources, with a musical hodgepodge of adapted cantorial tunes, East European folk songs, German and French marches and waltzes, and melodies lifted from Mozart, Halevi, Meyerbeer, and Verdi. Wolfgang himself did not know how to write music but he had a very good ear and he somehow collected it and put it all together. Goldfaden's early storyline may have been thin and the melodies borrowed, yet his fresh and often fantastic concoctions charmed the audience. The people loved his tales and hummed his songs at home and in the shop and the names of some of his characters, Schmendlich, Bobby Yachne, Kunilemo, entered the Yiddish language as familiar folk tongue. His success encouraged the formation of competing itinerant troops, and in a world with little regard for copyright, his work was soon imitated and plagiarized throughout the Yiddish speaking world. When popular professional Yiddish theater arrived in America with the start of the mass immigration from Eastern Europe, its first production in New York City was The Witch by Goldfaden. This was the gold standard. Now we're moving to America. The first Yiddish theatrical production in America took place in New York City in the summer of 1882. The event, featuring a rather bedraggled, newly arrived troupe from Europe, was financially backed by one Frank Wolf, a well-to-do saloon owner, who was also the president of the Henry Street Synagogue, where the sweet voice, Boris Tomaszewski, a recently arrived teenager, 
who worked in a cigar factory, was a chorister. In his memoirs, Tomaszewski offers a self-serving and sensational account of this first production, including efforts to sabotage the evening by uptown Jews, a tale whose veracity is highly questionable. But we do know, though, that the performance occurred on August 12, 1882, at Turn Hall, located at 6668 4th Street. It's between 2nd Avenue and the Bowery. You can go find the building now. It was home, White Turn Hall, where does the name come from? It, it was home to a local branch of the Turnenverein, a progressive German-American fraternal and gymnastic society. And the occasion was presented as a grand entertainment for um, a benefit organized by HEAS, HEAS, that's the predecessor of HIAS, with the intention of raising funds for a small group of Russian immigrants. This is 1882, the very beginning of mass immigration. The performers, the performance was inconspicuous. Attendance was light, and the acting amateurish. Yet the timing was fortuitous, as the number of Jewish newcomers was growing, and their desire for amusement would soon be felt. Many of these new arrivals were young, single, and though poor, they were eager to spend the little extra cash they had on entertainment. By year's end, the company, calling itself the Hebrew Opera and Dramatic Company, performed twice a week, on Friday night and Saturday matinee, offering in the Bowery House they rented a repertoire that consisted primarily of Goldfaden operettas, Goldfaden-like operettas, and some self-engendered plays. In 1883, plagued by financial trouble and personal feuds, the troupe split in two. Neither fared well, and by the end of 1884, the arrival of another company from Europe forced the original company, including Tomaszewski, to leave town and go, I'm ashamed to say, but go to Philadelphia. Okay, no more jokes about Philadelphia. Uh, most of the original players never developed much of a career on the stage. The exception was Boris, Boris Tomaszewski, who would return to New York three years later to become the long-standing matinee idol of the Yiddish theater. Over the next few years, more actors arrived. An influx prompted by an 1882 Tsarist ban on Yiddish language performances throughout the empire. New playwrights arrived as well. Most prominent were Joseph Latiner and the self-appointed professor Moshe Horvitz. Latiner's output was legendary. By 1903, he had written and staged more than 100 plays, some of them originals, others adaptations from German, French, or English sources. But Tyner wrote some of the most successful musical melodramas of the Yiddish stage, including The Jewish Heart, 1908, a huge box office success. Horvitz, like Latina, kept the script flowing, authoring more than 100 melodramas and operettas on Jewish and some American topics, including plays about the sensational Marie Barberi murder case, the Dreyfus Affair, and the Tisa Esler blood libel. Actors, some of whom would become the great stars of the Yiddish stage, kept arriving from Europe. The most notable was Zygmunt Feynman, 
Here we see him with his daughter, Celia, who later would be known as Celia Adler. She um, took the last name of her stepfather. Her mother was married to Feynman, divorced him, had a torrid affair with, with Adler, and they married ten to zillion kids of their own. Uh, really a lot, I to think. Eight or nine. David Kessler was a great actor. And Leon Blanc. They were followed in 1887, that is five years after the initial performance, by actors Jacob P. Adler and Kenny Lipton. And Goldfaden too came to America hoping to partake in the, the, the growing theatrical scene. Adler and Goldfaden were not successful and sailed back to Europe. Adler returned in, in 1890. A year later, he joined forces with Tomaszewski, and the two established themselves in New York. They leased the People's Theater. That's the one we've been to. Within a short while, each would become a megastar. Tomaszewski in musical comedy, in melodrama, Adler as a dramatic actor. Goldfaden too returned to New York in 1892, but remained a marginalized founding father, often dependent on Adler and Tomaszewski for financial support. He was vindicated shortly before his death when his play Benami, produced by Tomaszewski, proved a major success. His operators never lost their popularity. And though for a while pundits labeled them simplistic, relics of an early primitive stage um, in the history of the Yiddish theater, by the 1920s, the simple operettas became recognized not only as foundational works, but as genuine specimen of folk culture and served as a platform for highly theatrical avant-garde stage works, first in the Soviet Union and then in New York. The theatrical field of the 1880s was crowded and fierce rivalry developed between the companies. The stage and printed pamphlets were used to discredit and denigrate each other and actors were enticed by rival management all the time. Latiner, Horvitz, and some other playwrights were constantly supplying scripts of historical and biblical operettas, musical melodramas, and so-called site builder, uh, that is to say, dramatization of contemporary events. Remember, there was no television, there were no movies, there was only theater. And though most of the plays were crude, filled with plagiarized scenes and historical inaccuracies. They transported unsophisticated spectators from the dreariness of the tenements and the sweatshops to a fantasy world of glamour and amplified emotion. Tomaszewski, in his memoirs, offers a vivid description of the theatrical culture of the period. And here I need someone, or two people even, to read, who has good enough eyes. OK, go ahead. And two of it, yes.
I'm sorry? Tomaszewski. I was exaggerating a bit, but yeah, the feel is there. So play scripts in this kind of, of uh, atmosphere were not obviously regarded as venerated literary text. In this rambunctious theatrical culture, actors improvised lines, interjected songs, or stakes into the piece, um, very often ones that had absolutely no bearing on, on the storyline. Royce Tomaszewski, for instance, was known for bringing the house down by inserting his popular song, A Letter to Mama, whenever the pace of the performance slackened, regardless of what the play was about. The actors, who between the weekends had to appear in different plays during the week, often worked with unfinished scripts and had to learn a new role every couple of weeks. Consequently, they improvised, slipped in lines from other plays, and relied heavily on the prompter, a permanent fixture in the Yiddish theater. Moreover, most of the first generation of actors who had begun their careers in the 1870s and 80s were reared in a culture of popular entertainment where script served largely as vehicles for the display of your performative skills. At the heart of their world stood the actor, not the text, and acting was considered most commendable when it made the audience roar in laughter or when it raised primal emotions to fever pitch. At first, Yiddish performances were given only over the weekends and Jewish holidays. Sukkot was uh, particularly conducive for all kinds of special productions. And it's interesting, there was no real objection to Friday night and Saturday performances. Though the, in the early years, the stage reflected the audience religious sensibility so that um, on the stage, there was no representation of activities prohibited on the Sabbath. Lights were turned on in advance. Matches and cigarettes were not lit. And letters arrived conveniently unsealed. But other than that, there was no objection whatsoever. Now, young intellectuals, especially those acquainted with the Russian theater and the Russian drama, were contemptuous of the Yiddish theatrical fair, labeling it shun. Somebody here said the word. Uh, what does shun mean? Trash. Their dream of a literary Yiddish theater was realized with the arrival, of course, of Jacob Borden. And to take a look, this is a very, very special image that um, Evo has. Um, this is a micrograph. So it was, it was made shortly after uh, Gordon's death. The entire portrait is made of the um, text of Mira Leifos. Not that anyone can read it, but this is a very Jewish um, art using letters and words to create images. So you see at the bottom uh, Mira Leifos, and his name. So, Jacob Gordon, whom we mentioned already, introduced literary melodramas to the Yiddish repertoire. Gordon came to America in 1891 with the utopian uh, Amola movement. They wanted to uh, be farmers, nothing became of it, and um, he wrote, he had a career in writing, but he had no theatrical experience, but he greatly impressed actor Jacob Adler with his intellect and command of Russian culture. That was considered the highest culture one could attain. And so Adler commissioned him to write a play, a play titled Siberia. Well, excuse the pun, but it left the audience very cold. But Adler stuck to him, and the next play, the Yiddish Arcanic Lear, the Jewish King Lear, was an enormous 
phenomenal success. Gordon went on to compose more than 30 original dramas, mostly domestic problem plays, written in what was then considered a realistic mode. The best known are God, Men, and Devil, a play based on the Faust legend, Obit, with a somewhat different ending, Mirla Ephras, an intergenerational melodrama, recently produced in Washington, D.C. by Theater J. Uh, the Wild Man, in English, in English translation. The Wild Man, the tragic story of an older man married to a young woman. Dementia Americana, a satire of Jewish real estate mania. Homelessness, which tackled social conditions in the large cities. The Kreutzer Sonata uh, on the so-called new woman and the truth on mixed marriage. So these were all very, very um, successful plays. Gordon also translated and adapted more than 40 plays, introducing Jewish audiences to the works of Ibsen, Sudermann, Hauptmann, Tolstoy, and Gorky. Gordon revolutionized the Yiddish stage in many ways. When he entered actors, the, the theatrical scene here, actors generally delivered their lines in what was known as Deutschmerisch, an artificially Germanized Yiddish deemed more appropriate for higher class characters. Gordon put it, nobody spoke Deutschmerisch in real life. It is a completely fabricated, uh, uh, language, dialect, whatever you call it. Uh, Gordon put an end to this and it instituted a more natural stage language similar to what real people, real people spoke. He also terminated firmly ad-libbing and the interpolation of unrelated musical and comic uh, numbers and insisted that actors present a faithful rendition of the author's text. It was a new one, and they rebelled at first, but he insisted. Gordon's reputation went beyond Yiddish, and his sensational play, The Kreutzer Sonata, 1902, was the first Yiddish play to be translated and produced in English. Actress Berta Kalish, who played the lead female role, captured the attention of American producers and became the first major actress to cross over to major roles on the English speaking stage. You see, she's on the cover of a very prestigious magazine. She appeared in works by Sardou, Shaw, Metterling, Sudermann, and major European writers. After several years, Kalish's English language career faded and she gradually went back to the Yiddish stage. But for several years, she was a major sensation and a very demanding diva. Gordon's success encouraged more Yiddish writers to contribute to the stage, especially Leon Kobrin, who offered realistic portrayals of Jewish life in America, and David Pinsky, whose plays The Treasure and The Final Balance were translated into English and pro produced respectively by the Theater Guild in 1920, it was a very venerable institution, and by the Provincetown Players in 1922. These are major producing companies in the history of the American stage. In later years, the list of dramatists included major, major Yiddish writers, Shalom Ash, H. Leivik, Peretz Hirschbein, Ossip Dimov. Yet, we have to remember that the Yiddish theater was not a subsidized um, enterprise. It depended on box office proceeds. Even idealistic managers could not afford to devote themselves entirely to literary plays. The masses that supported the Yiddish state demanded their share of simple entertainment. And so the runaway hit of the pre-World War I era was the 1909 musical, The Spintele Yid. They 
quintessential Jew, if you can't translate it at all. Produced, directed, co-authored, and starring Boris Tomaszewski. It packed the People's Theater for 38 weeks. This was unheard of, but people loved it. It's a very convoluted story. I'm not going to tell you the whole thing. You need a diagram to, to work it all out. Okay. The prosperity of the Yiddish theater and the belief in its longevity was manifest in the construction of the Grand Street Theater in 1903, the first house built specifically for Yiddish plays. The other ones were rented, the ones I mentioned before. This was built for Yiddish theater. This is the outside, and see the inside. A very elegant, plush, large theater. It was located in the Bowery, and it opened with much fanfare with local politicians in attendance. The press noted that it was the first house in the city's history to be constructed specifically for non-English performances. The grand seating 1,700 people, reflected the social mobility and the aesthetic aspirations of its patrons. Its inaugural performance was Zion or on the Rivers of Babylon by Joseph Latiner, you remember him, a historical melodrama that alternated between dark moments and burlesque and in proto-Zionist mode told the story of the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem and the Jews returned to their homeland by permission of King Cyrus. Shortly before the First World War, the Yiddish theaters began to move further uptown. Improved economic conditions, the decline of the Bowery area, and the gradual migration of Jews out of the Lower East Side. By 1916, 75% of the city's Jewish residents lived outside the Lower East Side. And I saw once a comparative study of Jews and Italians, and by far, Jews moved out quickly. As soon as they can afford it, they move out of the Lower East Side. Uh, the Italians stayed on much, much longer. So uh, all this prompted the formation of a new Yiddish theater district on Second Avenue. You all know the term Second Avenue between Houston and East 14th Street. Lower Second Avenue had a rather dignified past. In the mid-19th century, it had been one of the aristocratic residential areas in the city and was later taken over by German immigrants who are now in the progress of leaving the area for more upscale parts of the city. For the Yiddish-speaking community, moving to Second Avenue from the Bowery represented upward mobility as the Second Avenue, as Second Avenue offered, writes Lula Rosenfeld. Short read. Alex, come on. And so, from the early 1910s to the 1940s, the short urban strip, often referred to as the Yiddish Rialto, was considered the undisputed mecca of the Yiddish theater worldwide. Here you see a map that shows you the different businesses and the theaters and the flagship theaters, restaurants, photo shops, uh, flower shops, you had it all. So, as mentioned, the, the playhouses of Second Avenue, four of them, four big playhouses, constituted the backbone of a thriving Jewish entertainment area that included cafe restaurants, cabaret, vaudeville, and also cinema houses. 
as well as various industry-related businesses such as photography, uh, studios, music, costume, flower shops, etc. The four flagship theaters on the avenue were imposing constructions that had been built specifically for Yiddish productions, each playhouse costing about a million dollars, a substantial sum when the average American worker earned about $25 a week. A million dollars was a huge amount. They were designed by first-rate architects, often from without the immigrant community, and they were lavish. The Second Avenue Theater was the first theater on the avenue. It was constructed in 1911 for the star David Kessler. Held for the beauty, the buildings do not exist, so I cannot show you photographs, but the plans exist. Held for the beauty of its exterior and plush interior, the house sat nearly 2,000 people and also boasted a summer rooftop theater. The National Theater, built for Boris Tomaszewski, opened in 1912. It was constructed in Italian Renaissance style with nearly, 2000, with nearly a 2,000 seat auditorium and a rooftop theater that could accommodate 1,000 patrons. The Yiddish Art Theater was built in 1925-6 for actor manager Morris Schwartz. We'll get to him in a minute. It had an auditorium that seated over 1,200 people and a restaurant cabaret in the basement. The last Yiddish theater house to be constructed on the avenue was a public theater, which opened its doors in 1927. Though its exterior was relatively modest, it had a rich interior and a seating capacity for over 1,700 patrons. We're talking about very large theaters and a very uh, vivacious entertainment zone specifically a Jewish entertainment zone. During this period, additional, this is not the end of it, additional Yiddish theaters were built in Brooklyn, Harlem, and the Bronx. Though mass immigration had come to a halt in 1924, theater managers regarded the Yiddish theater as a stable American institution. And so in 1927, there were Sorry, 24 Yiddish theaters across America. 24. 11 in New York. Four in Chicago. Three in Philadelphia. And one each in Baltimore, Boston, Cleveland, Detroit, Los Angeles, Newark, and St. Louis. This is not a meager, you know, little ethnic enterprise. This was major. But, well, you know what happened after the 1920s. The affluence and optimism of the 1920s disappeared after 1929. The crisis was not entirely due to the onset of the Great Depression. The Yiddish theater's high overhead, much higher than Broadway, combined with union demands that were not always very reasonable, took that toll. In 1929-30, the Yiddish Theater of New York closed in mid-season. This was a shock. Two minor theaters folded, and two Second Avenue houses were put up for sale. The following year, the Yiddish Theater seemed near collapse. Some big stars left for overseas tours or took jobs on the non giddish stage. By mid-season, the managers of the remaining nine New York Giddish theaters declared that if the union would not allow a 40% cut in personal salaries, they would close. The union threatened to strike. And so on December 8, 1930, the theaters went dark for two weeks. The union was finally forced to make concessions. It cut the salary scale by 10 to 25% and waived its power to set a quota for actors on every theater for the duration of the season. 
See, they could, the, the union was so strong, they could force uh, the manager of a theater to hire people that she really did not need in order to supply them with jobs. So as long as things were, you know, fine and the money kept rolling in, that was okay. But uh, when things became tight, that practice had to stop. Moreover, with the cessation of immigration in 1924, the Yiddish theater had in fact been gradually losing its base. Jewish audiences were drifting to Broadway and the motion pictures. Broadway, in turn, recognized that the enormous potential of Jewish audiences began to offer some so-called Jewish shows, which in turn offered crossover opportunities for some Yiddish actors who began to divide their time between Yiddish and English. Ludwig Satz, for instance, was immensely successful in Potash and Perlmutter. Rudolf Schildkraut appeared in the controversial God of Vengeance. Controversy killed his uh, English language career, but that's a separate story. Jacob Benami, great actor, joined Eva Legalian Civic Repertory Theater, where he played Chekhov and Tolstoy. And Paul Muni became a major movie star. So people are beginning to uh, be between and betwixt at first. That includes someone like Stella Adler, by the way, who started her career in the Yiddish theater. And when things are not going so well with the group theater, she would go back to Yiddish theater, back and forth, back and forth. Now, the 1920s and 30s saw the rise of a new cadre of stars, <coughs> some of them even American born and raised. The greatest musical comedy star was Molly P. Multi-talented singer comedian with a kind of androgynous uh, pixie look. Menasha Skulnik proved an outstanding comic and would gain great success in the post-war English-speaking stage. Alan Lebedev sang, and Jenny Goldstein was known as a queen of tearful melodrama appealed to quite a lot, quite many people. But first and foremost, uh, no, I shouldn't say that. Well, other stars were mostly associated with the so-called art theaters, which were the more literary theaters, theaters uh, devoted to, to uh, more serious drama. First and foremost, Maury Schwartz, as well as Jacob Benami, I've mentioned his name, Britta Gerstein, Celia Adler, and Joseph Bulloff. I'll show you this picture. Bulloff originated uh, the role of Ali Hakim in the original um, Oklahoma, obviously in English. So while operettas definitely continued to be the bread and butter of the, of the uh, Yiddish box office, the interwar era is remembered today mostly for its art theaters. Maurice Schwartz. Maurice Schwartz's name was interchangeable with the concept of Yiddish art theater. Schwartz was a towering figure of the modern Yiddish stage. In 1918, he founded the Yiddish Art Theater, Yiddish Kunsttheater, a New York City company devoted to the sophisticated production of quality drama in Yiddish. At the time, the idea of a Yiddish art theater was very much in the air, promoted by the cultural elite of the Jewish immigrant community who were dissatisfied with the prevalence of what they termed shunt, namely the popular escapist melodramas and operettas. Schwartz produced, directed, and starred in most of his productions. 
his name practically synonymous with that of his company. The Yiddish art theater was recognized by all as a prestigious communal institution. It gained critical acclaim and international renown. And despite the rapid process of Americanization of the American um, Yiddish-speaking community, it managed to remain active, albeit to the couple of hiatuses, until the mid-1950s. Schwartz, Schwartz's inexhaustible energy, unflagging commitment to his mission, and astute managerial skills made him made this longevity possible in the face of growing uh, untold difficulties, sociological and financial. He still stuck to it. All told, the Yiddish Art Theater under Schwartz staged nearly 200 plays. The repertoire included works by major Yiddish playwrights and by major Russian and European dramatists. In the 1930s, it's an interesting phenomenon, the repertoire became almost ex exclusively Jewish in content, whereas in the 1920s, there was still the idea of bringing universal drama in Yiddish translation uh, to the community. By the 1930s, there was really no need for that. And so when people went to the Yiddish theater, they wanted a Yiddish, a Jewish show. And what does he offer? He offers plays about the old world, about Eastern Europe, plays directly uh, connected to very current concerns, including the rise of fascism. Um, and plays about major um, Jewish historical personalities, including Herzl, for instance. Particularly successful were plays based on Ivy Singer's novel. First and foremost, Yosha Kalb, which was the biggest sensation of 1932. And while the other theaters faltered and didn't do well, you couldn't get a ticket for Yosha Kalb. It was as successful, I would say, as the Dibok was, and pretty much for the same reason. In 1937, the family, the Brider Ashkenazi, so based on Singer's novel. And in 1943, the family Karnofsky, uh, which dealt directly with, with uh, the flight of German Jewry and the conflicted sentiments of a third generation mixed uh, uh, marriage uh, child who at the end he cannot deal with the fact that he's both German and Jewish. And, and kills himself. These were very timely themes. But Yosha Kalb went beyond them all. It was a sensational success, and it drew unprecedented interest at home and abroad. Uh, there are, films with, there are uh, photographs of Charlie Chaplin, who's coming to see, um, Einstein coming to greet the, the actors. It was the big, think of 1932-33. Uh, now, what was special about Schwartz's productions? They had the reputation of being unabashedly theatrical, full of color, movement, emotion, grand gestures, and pathos. This theatricality gained the admiration of many Anglo critics. Notably, by the way, Brooks Atkinson, the revered critic of the New York Times, he adored Schwartz. Uh, reviews that he writes are just fantastic. Uh, Schwartz was, was a gifted character actor, always, as I mentioned, the star of his productions, but he surrounded himself with the best dramatic actors of the Yiddish stage. He also worked with top-notch musical directors and stage designers. His collaboration with set designer Boris Aronson, later one of Broadway's most celebrated set designers, 
is particularly striking. A standard experiment was their 1926 revival of Goldfaden's musical farce, The Tenth Commandment, as an avant-garde extravaganza. See what Aronson created here. We have human head and inside the hell of a modern factory. The Tenth Commandment was produced for the opening of Schwartz's new playhouse, an elegant Neil Moorish construction built on 2nd Avenue and 12th Street. 2nd Avenue and 12th Street, not far from here. And it is the only surviving Yiddish theater on 2nd Avenue. It's a movie theater now. It's an older picture, not very impressive. But you see the Moorish, still the Moorish element. But when you go, when you go in, to the main auditorium, not the, the little ones that they cut in the basement of the restaurant towards. This is one of the things you'll see. Ceiling with a Jewish menorah, lavish, large, gorgeous, breathtaking. The first time I went in to see, they turned all the lights on. I, I just couldn't believe my eyes. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Central Synagogue. Have you been in there? The same style, the exact same style. Rich, colorful, and it's a landmark, and it's protected. And no, only the inside is protected, but of course you cannot protect the inside without the outside. So we are guaranteed to have this landmark um, here with us, and it's really well worth a visit. It's the only remaining uh, Yiddish theater on 2nd Avenue, in fact, in New York. Well, the next chapter is really the post-war era. The Yiddish theater continues to shrink. 1945, there were four Yiddish uh, theaters in New York, uh, with three opening their seasons with musicals with titles such as uh, They All Want to Get Married, Good News, and Pleasure Girls. <laughs> so, Efforts to sustain quality Yiddish production did not cease. Um, they were modest and very often short-lived. In the 1950s and the 1960s, the great names of the golden era were disappearing. Actor Sarah Adler, widow of the great Jacob Adler, and a formidable actress herself, died in 1953 at the age of 95. Joseph Rumshinsky, for 50 years, the Yiddish state's composer of more than 100 operettas, died in 56. The Queen of Tears, Jenny Goldstein, who had made her stage debut at age six, died in 1960. And perhaps the most symbolic was the passing of Moore Schwartz, that same year, 1960, he died in Israel, uh, where he was working on a Yiddish production of Sholomash's Kiddush Hashem, he had a sudden heart attack and uh, passed quickly. And the buildings, they started to destroy the buildings. The bulldozers took, uh, took raised one theater after another. One became a parking lot, another one uh, just stood empty there, but the theaters disappeared. Second Avenue, in many ways, was no more. But this time, went by, both actors and audience of the Yiddish uh, theater grew older. And what happens is that people who went to Yiddish shows wanted, they didn't want a, a, a lit to literary play. They wanted something nostalgic. They wanted to hear songs uh, they recognized from before. And, uh, and that was, Pretty much, it's almost kind of going back to the early years. But the, I would say in the 1970s or so, the gradual arrival of theater scholars, 
followed by a new generation of actors and playwrights who were eager to find out more about their ethnic and theatrical roots beyond Fiddler made itself felt. They became excited by the story of the Yiddish theater and began to document its, its history in film and to write modern adaptations that revealed new meanings in the old play text. These playwrights included Nama Sandro, David Margulis, and Tony Kushner, who adapted respectively Goldfaden's Kunilemo, Shalom Asha's God of Vengeance, and Ansky's The Dibuk. Performers like Mandy Potenkin, who successfully presented Mama Loshen, a one-man Broadway show of Yiddish songs, and such diverse filmmakers as Arnon Goldfinger's a Goldfinger, whose documentary, The Comediant, offers an exuberant account of the life and career of Yiddish comedy stars Pesach Borstein and Dillian Lux and their children. And we have, of course, the Cohen brothers, whose film, Serious Man, opened with an evocation of the Dibbuk. And just think of the last season. Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish has proven a hit. And Paula Fogel's play, Indecent, written in response to Shalom Asha's God of Vengeance, won three Tony nominations, winning two, including Best Direction for, of, uh, for Play for Rebecca Teichmann. Several months ago, as I mentioned, Theater J, a smaller enterprise in, in Washington, produced Mirola Efros. And I have to tell you, the audience was riveted and though it's such an old time play, but it gave chance to actors, especially in the lead, to really perform all the way. And so it's true, we no longer have 24 Yiddish theaters across the country. But think what a treasure trove, the story of the Yiddish theater offers to those who are interested, who want to know more about their ethnic roots, who want to know more about the theatrical roots. The treasure, much of it here at Evo, is readily available. All you have to do is just look at it, and it's there. And you can choose whatever appeals to you. So I, I will finish on this note. Um, just to say that the Yiddish theater is dead is wrong. To, to present a picture of something very thriving is also kind of silly, but it's something that we have that is at our disposal, that we go back to, that inspires people, and I think will, as, as the number of translations of plays increases, more and more people um, mostly Jews, but not only, will find interest in these plays and will find new meanings in them uh, for, for concerns that uh, we deal with nowadays, not only in order to reproduce something old, but to produce something new out of it. So, I'm positive and hopeful. Thank you. Now don't tell me why didn't you mention this one and that one because that's impossible. Could we do um, some questions for the audience? Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Let's start first with questions, then with statements, okay? How about that? Real question. Can, can you speak a little about, about the influence or lack thereof, if any, on the pre-war Yiddish theater and the development of the post-war entertainment industry in upstate New York, known as the Borscht Belt? Was there any effect of one or the other? Yes. I would say that, you know, when I was looking for a link between the Yiddish theater and the American theater, and the impact, and the influence we all talk about is how can you prove it? And then I realized it was the board. Because it was a very fair where it was, was a kind of 
Can you describe the links, if any, between Yiddish theater and um, klezmer performances? Well, klezmer performances, I'm not, there was klezmer band, so a musical band, uh, and some of the musicians also worked in the Yiddish theater and performed their work. But, but the klezmer phrase is something much more recent, uh, and I'm not so sure that The Yiddish theater was filled with music. So it was very easy to take a song and, and uh, adapt it uh, to uh, the, uh, the, the, the placement music or to They constantly work together. But the music was there all the time. Hi, I was wondering if you have in your research come across anything to do with the Camp Tamament uh, institution and also in particular there was a satirical Yiddish Mikado that they did? Yes, the Mikado was a, uh, that I do, I, I did come across it, I have the text of it. And it's interesting because it takes us back to the Catskill. Um, there was a time when in, in the 40s, where somehow there was a red Mikado, and a this Mikado, and a that Mikado. And Danny Kay, who was in, performing in the mountains, uh, did, with, with, um, with a few others, they wrote something called the Yiddish Mikado. But it's interesting, the text is very simple Yiddish, but it's already written in English letters. So these, which is very indicative of this generation, they understood Yiddish, they knew Yiddish from home mostly, but they could no longer really write a text in Yiddish. And the Yiddish was simple. But yes, it's there, and uh, where did I read, I think? It's in the town. Of... with Judy Garland, they, they uh, performed it, but well, privately. Not there's, not yeah, the, the little bit that I read, because it's in the Tamament Library, the little bit, I haven't seen the full, script, I'm really interested in where you found it, but the, the one of the punchlines is Mikade Avada. Uh -huh. And apparently, it was actually the late 30s, I think, when that triple Mikado thing was happening, the black Mikado, the red Mikado. But what I heard was that then when Danny Kaye went to Hollywood, it was such a kind of um, in-demand thing at parties that he would reprise it for the, the Hollywood people, because they knew that he had done it when he was younger. But you see, Mikado Abate doesn't take a lot of years to, uh, you know, it's, uh, that's exactly the point I'm making. It's, 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 it's not, it's not a very, very very simple, but it's a whole generation that was uh, kind of bicultural. They worked in camps, in, in camp tournaments, for instance, because the labor uh, related uh, camp. And yes, they, they were very familiar with both, so. Actually, Sholomash was one of the people who went to Camp Tim. It was a little more like for the middle class. They were across the lake.
from the labor camp, which was the ILGWU camp, they were actually like a, like a, for people who are used to going to Broadway reviews, this is where they would go in the summer. So they were actually non-ideological, which was uh, a difference for them. They were making fun of the ILGWU um, Red Mikado, apparently. Thank you, that was really interesting to hear. I was wondering, um, once theaters and, and directors and dramaturgs started establishing themselves and we were really able to engage with their methods, I was wondering what kind of body of acting theory, if ever was produced by Yiddish directors and like Yiddish theater companies, if any of that is, is still around, is still written down somewhere and is accessible to, to us and how? Keeping minded for, for um, for Yiddish uh, theater people, I'm talking now about the more literary people, uh, the, the ideal was the Russian theater. There's no question Russian stage, Russian acting, Russian uh, plays. And so, who is the first American to sit and study with, with Stanislavski? The lava. Meets with Stanislavski in Paris and, and becomes later the advocate of the Stanislavski so called system here in America. To this day, it is taught in the Salavi Theory of Acting by her grandson, who runs the studio, and always refers very respectably to this dynasty that he comes from. This started, in fact, in Russia, came to America, was greatly influenced by uh, Stanislavski's uh, teaching. The other two kids uh, brought in Russian theories of, of acting were the Habima members. Habima came to New York from uh, after the tour of Europe. Uh, they were trained in by the best. They worked with Stanislavski, they worked with Bastango. Um, they had, uh, they had been uh, a theatrical education that really no one here had. And since the company split, some continued, stayed with Abima, and eventually ended up in, in Palestine, and some stayed here. Um, you know, Bera Snyder, the director of the theater that I wrote on New York uh, came from And uh, yes, he spoke a lot. He pursued the actors with the theories that he uh, absorbed in, in the French classic during the years of the And became also a highly desirable acting uh, So if you look at some of the best known uh, acting coaches in New York at the time, they nearly all do. And where do they come from? They come from the group theater at Salata. It's a whole Russian influence. So the idea that the, if you're talking about the method of acting in a more serious way, it's all Russian. That's the idea. And it's very different from American acting, which is much more subdued and uh, quite a different nature. So it's, it's, uh, yeah. Um, hi. You mentioned the Tisa Esler blood libel. I didn't catch who wrote the play, and it, is this, can, is, can I look at the script? Is it available? Wait, wait, I don't understand. You mentioned the Tisa Esler blood, blood libel. libel, right. Is that a play? Yeah. That's a, so I, I didn't catch who wrote it, the play. Wait. Tisa Esler, that, that's so uh, interchangeable, those two, that I, I have to check. I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, it, it, which one of the two it is? Ah, I need to make a mistake. It's, I think, I think it's Horvitz. I don't know mm -hmm. the other Is it possible? Either Horvitz or Alzheimer. Is it possible to get a copy of the play? 
Is it possible to get a copy of the play, of the no, script? No, quite very few of them have been made. And, mm -hmm. and they were no. OK, thank you. Why are you interested in because my fi my grandfather was involved in that blood libel. So. But the the uh, interesting thing is that the the uh, in the theater at the time worked almost like television. I mean, the the no movie, the no how, you want to see a visualization of, of current events, and you get it in the theater. The early in the theater, a lot of. Them. So. Okay. Final question. Okay, I'm, I'm going to split this. Um, one thing that just occurred to me, uh, the Yiddish Actors Union and, and the papers and so forth that have been in the news in the last couple of years, do they contain anything of real interest to scholars? And then I had a question about... Uh, oh, wait, let's start yeah. the Hebrew okay. Actors Union. The Hebrew Actors Union no longer exists. Right. Uh, the building does. Right. And there are all kinds of fancy dreams of turning it into a museum for Yiddish theater, except I have no idea who would pay for it. It's, it's uh, on sec off Second Avenue. It's a nearly dilapidated building. Right. And when I went in, uh, there was no running water. And even though there was one neighbor who lived there for some, for some arrangement, and all I wanted to do after half an hour there is, is go wash my hands. <laughs> it's so filthy. So, uh, but were but there, it does exist. Were there materials that were saved anywhere there or archived? There were some materials and they're all here at Evo. They're at Evo, yeah. okay. Everything is at Evo. Um, and uh, what's his name? The, the uh, Ellie Broad gave some money when he read in the paper that they're yep. going to, okay. you know, uh, it's uh, probably destroy the building or whatever, and he gave money to save the materials. Okay. And the other oh, part is. Catalog. Just just about 1924 versus 1929, as Yiddish theater was subsiding. Um, I know Menasha Skolnik, I think, in, in the play Fischl der Garatener, the successful one, had a line about um, I, it was a whole setup for who is the first lady. He was asked by immigration officials, and he said, There is no first lady instead of saying Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, it used to be the Statue of Liberty, but she died. Um, or something very close to that. And, and would you say, though, that that was a real blow, 1924, versus all the other things, films coming in and, and so forth? Yeah, OK. You know, I'm surprised that the one question I was not asked was that supposed to be made. Mentioned it. I did not mention it. But the folk scene had, had an important role. However, they were an amateur company. And they uh, were connected to the Albert Ring. And you only know so much about them when they use the theater's rising. They become important in the 1950s and 60s because they still present. Um, uh, literary plays, whereas the other performers don't, and they also begin to incorporate some of the old Yiddish actors into the amateur production. So they had a very important role in promoting the idea of uh, literary theater, but uh, thanks to the change, everything is changed. So much. It was a great talk. Very good. It's hard to squeeze so much into. Wow, it's a quarter of